Hello, everybody. We want to welcome you to our Q&A that we're having with Bebeck Das today. Bebeck is an attorney. Bebeck is an attorney that works for GC Realty and Development, uh, not work for, but works with uh, for five, six uh, years now, I think, right? Am I, am I right? I think, we're, I think we're almost, yeah, we're at six. Okay, yeah. So, so <laughs> we've, uh, you know, obviously GC's been around since 2003 and we've been working with Bebeck for the last five, six years, five, six wonderful years, let me tell you. He, he's been uh, great counsel for us and he's referred us, uh, He's referred us business. He's, he's always there to take our calls uh, night and weekend. So um, he's really helped us uh, get where we're at. So I always like to be able to promote uh, our power partners, I guess, if, for lack of better of, uh, words. Actually, it's a pretty good word. You can't go any better than that. I guess. Power, power <laughs> thanks, that's a pretty good word. I feel really strong right now. <laughs> that, that's pretty good. That's a pretty good word. So uh, people that, uh, how I met Bebeck, uh, just kind of give a high level. Um, I met my partner, Cliff McHugh. Uh, you guys went to University of Chicago together, right? That's how you guys yes, met? Yes, we did. Yes, we did. He was and a smart one. And then when me and Cliff uh, teamed up, he, he brought uh, B back in and said, hey, I trust this guy. We've got to use this guy. So um, here we are. Now, this is a Chicago, uh, Chicago uh, property manager company. Uh, but just heads up, uh, B back is a Yankees fan. So um, don't hold it against him. I'm just putting that out I'm, there now. I'm not uh, going to pull up my, my helmets that I have here in the office. <laughs> lawyers like full disclosure. So I'm just disclosing out there. He is, uh, <laughs> he's a, a Yankees uh, fan. So. Um, all right, so let's get into uh, some questions here. Um, well, I got a few questions we'll break down here. So um, right now, with everything that's going on, we have uh, some crazy times, and there's a lot of questions out there and, and a lot of assumptions. So we'd love to hear what your uh, advice is on a few things. So first off, right now, um, it is uh, June 16th. Can we serve five-day notices right now to tenants? Okay. In so Chicago I'm going to- In Chicago or the suburbs. Yeah, and I, I'm going to tackle this kind of a bit broader picture understanding of what's going on because there's uh, what's called the CARES Act that is governing how uh, federally subsidized tenants or owners, property owners, uh, who receive some kind of federal subsidy for their property or their, le or, or their t uh, rent payments, etc. cetera, uh, there's a separate set of rules for them as there are for Illinois based. Uh, landlords and tenants. Now, so for example, property that will fall under the CARES Act would be properties where let's say the tenant's receiving some kind of Section 8, CHA type of uh, funding, or even the owner of the property is receiving some kind of FHA funding or some other federally subsidized loan. Let's focus on CARES first. Under CARES, there's a separate set of requirements. July 25th is right now as we stand here today is the cut date for when notices can be issued for back rent let's say from the time of uh let's say about let's say march 17th i think was when everything kind of really went into effect for covid related um you can issue a notice on Mar on july 25th but it cannot be a five-day notice under the cares act it actually has to be a 30-day so it would look identical to a five-day notice that you might customarily see or issue in the event of uh, delinquent rent from a tenant, but you'd be issuing actually what is a 30-day notice. Um, and then after that time expires, uh, you can then proceed with filing your lawsuit, uh, which would then take you now, you're looking at August 25th around, give or take a couple of days here or there and when it gets served. Um, so that's under the CARES Act, and it's really important that owners and tenants will all understand now how that's going to be enforced and how the courts can construe that is kind of up in the air as we sit here today, because whether or not if, if a landlord, let's say, incorrectly sends a five-day notice and does somehow fall under the CARES Act and didn't realize it, who raises that issue? You know, is it an affirmative defense for the tenant to raise, the court make a judicial finding on their own? We don't know the answer to that yet. So, but I, at least for technical purposes, for anyone sitting at home and trying to figure this out a little bit, you know, there's it's still an, there's still a lot of unknowns, but that's the steadfast rule at this point. Um, and again, keep an eye on whether the CARES Act and whether that, that order um, or the statute gets extended out further but right now it's july 25th now i'm going to split that now you have landlords who don't fall under the cares act they own their property free and clear 
Um, they don't have any federal funding. The tenant is just a regular tenant who doesn't receive any kind of CHA or some kind of federal subsidy for paying their rent. They don't fall under the, the rules, but they're going to still follow under the Illinois statute and stay at home rule. Okay. So, uh, under the, the way it's, uh, phrased at this point, um, under the order, you can't commence an eviction until that expires. Uh, but that doesn't mean you can't issue notices. So you could still issue a five day notice now, uh, as we read it, and as we understand it right now and how the, how the Illinois state home order, uh, reflects, but actually moving forward with filing of the eviction will still have to wait. And I think we're right now in stage phase three before phase four opens up. Um, so phase four is going to, uh, change how, uh, you know, when you can file your lawsuit. And I think at this point, uh, we're what, July 16th, and we're looking at, uh, sorry, June 16th, and we're looking at probably around a July 8th-ish uh, date when everything's gonna start opening up, courthouses are opening up, and you know, we can address that issue <laughs> next. I think you have some other questions about it, but hopefully that answers your questions. Uh, that's good, so um, on the notices and the eviction, so people, can find out if they have uh, um, a, a federally backed loan uh, by looking at, going to Fannie Mae look up or, or um, Freddie, uh, Mac. Freddie Mac look up. And then also a dead giveaway is if you have a section eight tenant in your property or your building, then obviously that's a dead giveaway that uh, you're, you're falling under the CARES Act, correct? Absolutely. Yep. Yep. And, and definitely do that due diligence before, because if you think you're not um, and you issue, you can, let's say you assume that you're not, a CARES Act, you fall under the CARES Act, um, and you issue a five day, you know, there's, you file an eviction down the road when the court's opening up, uh, you know, all the tenant would probably have to do at that point is raise the issue. Um, again, uh, it's unclear how the, the judges and the court system are going to handle it, whether they're going to make a unilateral decision on that. You know, I have some opinions about it. Uh, you know, I'm sure there's public policy issues that are going to come into play about evictions as to whether the city is going to want to be in a position of evicting people left and right um, with everything that's going on. So it's considerations that are outside of this box. And as I like to say, um, you know, sometimes there's kind of a rote way of doing evictions when we did it before, but all bets are off now. Gotcha. All right, cool. So you run with a lot of circles in and around the city um, and your attorneys and, and you have a bunch of clients. What is the likelihood that something passes regarding these, uh, the city passes something crazy where we can't evict or, or is there anything on the horizon you think will pass? So that there is an order being considered um, and there's no, again, steadfast answer right now as to what they're doing. Um, the, uh, the city itself wants to help subsidize uh, tenants, but they're really focusing on tenants and as versus the owners. Um, so there's a lot of shifting of the burden onto the property owners, which I think is going to probably affect smaller landlords versus the bigger real estate uh, investment companies um, as to whether or not they're going to allow these eviction go. So there's a lot of give and take that's going on between, and this is not just in Illinois, this is not just in Chicago, it's nationwide, um, where the burden, if it falls on the, the property owner, I mean, they're taking money out of their personal savings to kind of pay their loan that they have to pay while they're not getting rent. Meanwhile, tenants may be getting rent subsidy or, 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 or just say, hey, you know, I know there's COVID going on and I know I can't be evicted and I'm just not going to pay and I'll deal with it later. You know, one thing for those tenants to remember is that you're still in breach of the lease. That doesn't mean the lease that exists is gone. You still owe that money. Now, if, if tenants are listening to this, pay your rent, if you, you know, or talk to your landlord about it. Um, because at the end of the day, that's going to snowball because at some point it is going to open up at some point evictions are going to happen. And, and, uh, you know, monetary judgments could be found in full amount regardless of COVID. Um, so, you know, in terms of, you know, going back to kind of your question about what this, what is being considered, uh, they're looking at maybe extending the time for in which, uh, eviction moratorium will be probably for another 60 days. Um, is in the process. They're part of that moratorium is what's being considered by the city is funding 
and helping tenants as well as property owners paying. And that's the give and take that's going on right now. And there's, there's no clear answer as to what is going to ultimately be uh, decided by everybody. But I mean, everybody's kind of in it together. <laughs> You're both sides, tenants and landlords and owners. So um, okay, we'll see how it plays out. All right. Um, so let me ask this. I'm sure you're getting phone calls um, regarding people that had, I don't know if, uh, delinquent tenants prior to COVID. And now they're using uh, these moratoriums you're talking about and, and maybe these future laws. Like, I'm sure you're getting clients calling you. What advice are you giving them for someone that had, uh, was that maybe it was a week late in filing that eviction or, or uh, um, took too long of, of kind of making the first steps of getting that bad tenant pre COVID out? Yeah. Uh, so, I have a few actually of those files kind of sitting sadly on my desk because uh, the timing was unfortunate where we did even file the, the eviction and they didn't get served in the time. And then all of a sudden everything kind of froze. So um, that that's not, I mean, again, it's going to be determinative of the judge, but I, I think those are still going to be enforced as if they were like, as if COVID did not happen. Okay. Uh, those tenants are just, kind of in my opinion just getting lucky and getting them some more time themselves some more time but um in terms of moving forward i mean if you've already filed that eviction um you know you're just gonna have to wait for your future date when you're getting in there in court and how that's going to play out again we're still not 100 percent sure um, we're doing a zoom call and i've been doing some hearings on zoom hearings uh whether evictions are going to happen that way unclear um, I would, I would venture to guess that, you know, especially in eviction court, there are a lot of people in a courtroom and how, uh, they're going to handle all these, uh, let's say pre COVID evictions, are those going to go first? And then they're going to ha handle the second ones, uh, thereafter the post COVID ones. Um, next I unclear, but if you've already gotten on file, you're just waiting for your date. Um, if you have not filed, I guess, I would probably take the position of, you know, better be safer than sorry. Maybe hold off. Nothing's happening at this moment. So maybe hold off on filing that eviction. But uh, um, in terms of enforcing it, it shouldn't be an issue under COVID uh, if you had an existing notice already given. Okay. What, so, you know, at GC, you know, we're big fans of trying to control our destiny and uh, especially in Cook County, the, the system, as we all know, and most people listening know, is slower than most and very tenant friendly. So cash for keys, uh, give us any, your, your one-on-one uh, opinion on cash for keys and, and as an option right now during uh, this. So, you know, um, kind of relating back to what I talked about before, um, you're right, tenant friendly. Um, Chicago's notorious for being tenant friendly and that's the, those laws were created, you know, based on historical reasons, you know, about there was bad landlords back in the day and, and eventually these regulations and CRLTO came into effect. And, and so, you know, that's why we sit here today and have to deal with a lot of legal ramifications and issues that we have to watch out for. And that's, that's what, uh, that's what keeps me up at night. Right. Um, so, uh, in terms of, you know, cash for keys, what I've been advising my clients is, you know, see the landscape around you. Everything's changing by the day. Um, it, you know that, you know, what I've already told you, we don't know when courts are going to officially open. We have some dates that have been given to us, but, you know, we were getting dates I'll tell you in March that we're saying we're going to reopen in April and here we are June 16th still kind of sitting here and a lot of unknowns. So keeping that in mind, you know, there are a couple of things I, I think landlords and owners should think about. Um, first, you know, if you want to sit there and evict somebody, you know, don't forget there are a lot of other people hurting and you're going to get a place of potentially what you may consider a bad tenant with another bad tenant. Um, who's going to be coming in and out and getting to show the property and how long it's going to sit open. And if you have a tenant who's always good up until COVID happens, you know, those are people that you might want to really negotiate and you may have to bend a little bit and continue to make, you know, get that cash in the door and, and, and keep yourself afloat and work with them. And, and again, this is not, you know, 
I guess be pre COVID, a lot of people just, they lawyer up, right? Um, think again, you got to think outside of the box and everybody's going to have a different situation. Every owner's going to have a different situation or relationship with each tenant. And you kind of got to read the tea leaves a little bit. Um, cash for keys is always great. If you think, Hey, you know what? Not going to be a problem for me to get somebody else in here. Um, if you do cash for keys, you know, you don't have to worry. You don't know how long these deadlines won't matter to you, but you not, doesn't guarantee the next person that comes in the door is going to put you in that predicament as well. All right. Very optimistic outlook there. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, so cash for keys, control your destiny. We'll leave it at that. But, uh, yeah, yeah. um, cool. Um, so one other topic, uh, before we get off here, um, tenants or investors buying properties, inheriting pop, uh, property violations or court cases. What's uh, something during their due diligence that you recommend as a buyer's attorney, or maybe you're, maybe it's just the attorney that's supposed to be doing it, uh, that investors local or out of state should be looking at uh, before buying, uh, buying here in Chicago? Okay. Yeah. And so when in real estate uh, transactions that I handle, uh, let's say from the buyer's perspective, you know, first thing, you know, if you're out of state, you know, there's an attorney modification period that comes in and you have your standard disclosures that the seller is required to make. Um, additionally, when I do modifications, I add specific requests as to, you know, any knowledge, seller has any knowledge about any kind of violations, pending violations and what's been done to fix it or re remediate it. Now, a seller can willfully ignore that or misrepresent and you have a potential cause of action against that seller for misrepresenting if they knew, hey, they did get written notice of some violations they existed and they didn't correct and they didn't tell the buyer. So that's that's one step. Um, you know, that's kind of like the first step just to put the seller on notice, hey, you need to let us know of any due diligence issues. Um, secondarily, you can do go to uh, chicago.gov and look up building code violations. So that's housing court based um, administrative court based uh, uh, violations. And you can pull that up by just putting in the property address. Um, if you have the property pin or the, uh, the tax identification number for the, for the property, you can also search for it that way. And you'll be able to pull up the history. Um, that's a, it's still a little archaic and a little bit unclear as to what's going on in the case on the electronic docket when you pull it up, but you can also contact the city of Chicago or city of Chicago attorneys and there's numbers to reach. Uh, you can also uh, call 311 um, to see if there's any violations on the property. So that's another option as well. And then um, finally, uh, there's, the there's a difference between administrative court and uh, the housing court, which is actually takes place at the Daly Center, um, where uh, that's governed by the Cook County Clerk of Court. And you can go to that website for the uh, Circuit Court of Cook County Clerk of Court, and you can either locate the type of case, if there's any type of case named against that owner, you can type in and try to find it um, through a search uh, and you can pull up any case that might be named against that owner and pull up housing court case, or you can identify it by the property address. Usually in housing court cases, you'll have the property address listed in there and they'll show up on a list of, of cases and may pop up there. Now, um, electronically, you can't obtain the copy of the complaint but of course you can do your attorney or however you choose to you can address that during your attorney review period like hey you know this popped up can you provide us documents or let us know what happened with this um and 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 to be honest i mean uh sometimes sellers aren't even aware they do you know sometimes notices go missing in the mail and they don't know about it so it's not necessarily true that uh you know that a seller is purposefully, you know, withholding information. I've seen it happen, of course, but, um, you know, I try to, I try to think optimistically on that one <laughs> that yeah. everybody's working in good faith. Right. Yeah. Well, the city's uh, database on uh, mailing address is not up to date. So when those violations get sent to the property a lot and the guy lives in Atlanta, that uh, that guy in Atlanta definitely does not know because the tenant does not usually share that with him. So um, it's a good point that not all sellers are bad, but there's a lot of information out there that could, hurt you even if the seller is not bad yeah and and i'll say from a, if there's you know people think about litigation oh i want to assume like there's a, a part of the one of the elements of the burden that they have to meet is that the, you know the seller had knowingly withheld this information so it's you know but usually those things work themselves out 
throughout the contract negotiation time and, okay. and ho hopefully don't go down that road. <laughs> cool. I know you have a full, uh, I know you're always busy. You always got your phone ringing. Uh, and, uh, I'm sure some people uh, watching this might have some personal questions. How can people reach out to you? What's the best way they could, uh, maybe talk to you about their personal situation? Yeah, well, I mean, I, usually for a uh, purpose of just having everybody's contact information, um, I, I usually say you can email me. Um, my uh, law firm is DOS Law LTD, and my email handle is bdos at DOS Law LTD, and I can spell that. It's B as in boy, D as in David, A as in Anna, S as in Sam, at DOS Law. That's D as in David, A as in Anna, S as in Sam, Law ltd.com um so they can reach me that way or they can bug you and you can direct them to me I can yes definitely anyone that. uh i'm always <laughs> an email intro so um cool cool well thank you very much i appreciate uh coming on here and uh we gotta do this again soon of course thank you and thank you always uh, you you are you are powerful absolutely I like that. Our well. partner, power partner. Our partner. Our Powerful partner. sounds too, uh, too much. You know, yeah. And then you got that flag behind you. You're good. Yeah. <laughs> Re represent, man. Represent. So, all right, cool. Thanks, Thanks dude. Mark. Appreciate it. All right, bye.